South Division. We will continue now after our break. So please settle down. Remember those who turn on their noise making devices, whatever they are, turn them back off. Now without any further ado, we're going to bring the Toastmaster of the Day back. Felicia Hubbard. Ms. Hubbard. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and guests. How many of you have a Facebook account? Show of hands? Ooh, outstanding. There are over 500 million Facebook accounts. That's one out of 13 people in the world. How many of you have a Twitter account? Show of hands. Okay, a little bit less. And that stands to reason because there's 150 million Twitter accounts. Now, in order for us to really appreciate the growth of Facebook, 
It took radio 38 years to reach 50 million people. It took television 13 years to reach 50 million people. It took the internet four years. And when <coughs> Facebook reached 200 million, they accomplished that in less than one year. Social media, what is this? Social media is one of six categories. One, blogs and microblogs, like Twitter. You have content communities, such as YouTube. You have collaborative projects, such as Wikipedia. Social networking sites, such as Facebook. There's virtual game worlds, such as World of Warcraft. There are virtual social worlds, such as Second Life. Social media has changed us. What has it done? It has enabled us to reconnect with those whom we've lost contact. We can keep, we can keep touch with those people, one person, many people. <coughs> Social media is a wealth of information. Businesses can tap into the minds of consumers and therefore they can market more intelligently. There's a, a blurring between the public and private. We no longer passive and consume information as we did with radio and television. Rather, we're more active because we can simultaneously consume and produce online content. And that's amazing. So what do we do? Well, let's look at it this way. <coughs> it's a bunch of zeros and ones, right? And that has changed us. Zeros and ones. It's amazing. Do you know what? We've actually learned a different language. <coughs> what does LOL mean? Anybody? <laughs> Laugh out loud. How about TMI? Too much information. Too much information. <laughs> BTW. BTW. By the way. And K. Okay. And apparently it was just too painful to punch in that one character. <laughs> I don't understand. But what I do understand is this. Clearly, there's a desire and a need to communicate, right? So, in all of these zeros and ones, there is complexity. Sometimes with more complexity, sometimes you lose quality. <laughs> You're right, young fella. Back in my day, we used to hold up our head up high, and we used to wave at people from across the street. No, these days people do it a little differently because they're down with their heads down and they're punching and pecking away at these things. They don't even know I'm ahead of them. I tell you, if it were up to me, I'd snap my fingers and go back to the way things used to be. That's right, that human element, that's what I'd introduce them. Human element. Well, sir, I think I can make that happen. Bonjour. Good morning. It's this. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to speak to you briefly about connecting social. Now, I don't know all three of those languages fluently, but if I did, you'd call me multilingual. If I knew two languages, you would call me bilingual. And if I knew only one language, what would you call me? <laughs> Sorry about that, it's true. But you know what we need to do? We have to be able to reach out and be willing to learn from people. I had an opportunity a while back to visit my wife's country, her home country, Honduras. And this is fresh off two years of basic Spanish. Now, my new relatives welcomed me with open arms, not because I spoke Spanish fluently. No, no, it's because I didn't force them to learn English on my behalf. And I learned quite a bit from my Honduran experience. <laughs> I enjoy it. Now sometimes you may encounter a person from a different country and they'll change their birth name to an Americanized name. Now, this is clearly an attempt to assimilate to the U.S. culture. And you know what? I totally understand that. But what we have to do is be better hosts. Better hosts. 
Remember? This is the melting pot. So let's make them feel more at home. Let's at least learn their birth. I'm sure there's an app for that. <laughs> so it takes more effort, yes, but the education is well worth it. In fact, look, that reminds me. There's Judaism is religion, Jewish are the people. Christianity is the religion, Christians are the people. Islam is the religion, Muslim are the people. So when you hear the term Islamic, that refers to an inanimate object, like books, clothing, much like we use oriental designs, rugs. What we need to do is to establish a balance between technology and the human element. Make them work together in concert so that we may be able to socially connect. Socially connect. So instead of referring to a person as Asian, let's learn their heritage. Find out if they're Israeli, Indian, Korean. Let's forget Latino, Hispanic. Let's remember Mexican, Peruvian. Don't be a zero. Be the one that uses the tools that we have. Oh, and BTW. Let's learn to live in peace. So I bid you a shalom. Peace be with you. Aslam Thank you. <laughs>
Nineteen days later, his grandmother, while cooking for the family, had a towel draped over her arm, caught fire from the burner on the stove. She died four days later as a result of third degree burns over 90% of her body. Bob witnessed this. By the time he was 17, he dropped out of high school, joined the army, and they promptly sent him to Vietnam. Those of us here, I don't think Vietnam has provided any favors for anybody. It introduced him to heroin. He learned a lot about alcoholism. He became disabled while in Vietnam. But it was truly his relationships here in the States that suffered as a result of that experience. When he came back, life wasn't the same. His relationships were crippled beyond any physical injuries he endured in Vietnam. So much so that when my Uncle Jack was dying of cancer in 1994, the last words he said to my Uncle Bob, and I'll clean this up for you here, but he said, don't be a jerk your whole life. Sobering moment, but not enough to last. Uncle Bob kept drinking. Five more years went by. And then all of a sudden, March 20th of 1999, he woke up and he decided he was tired of being a jerk. He gave up alcohol cold turkey despite court orders, despite losing driving privileges, despite probably what averages to months of detox in this very hospital. He decided of his own volition to stop drinking. Just in time, too, because his mother, my grandmother, was diagnosed with cancer later that year. She enabled him for a long time, but he was able to return the favor. And do you know that when she passed on March 8th of 2001, he took her pain meds and flushed them down the toilet? I didn't understand the significance at that time, what that really meant. But in retrospect, I am so proud of what he did. Think about it. You've got somebody with a chemical dependency compounded with the death of a loved one. And he had the strength to let go. For years, <coughs> my uncle was an example of how not to live my life. I was embarrassed to even call him uncle. For a long time, I just called him Bob. I was ashamed. He was giving me a bad rap. But in the last 10 years, truly, he became somebody that led by example. And for that, I am so thankful. He told me that he found his peace with God. And when he left this plane, I knew exactly where he went. He taught me that even if you are in the trenches of your life, you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And if he could do that, who am I to judge him? He taught me that if God hasn't given up on somebody yet, it's not my place to do so. Do you have a Bob in your life? Maybe it's somebody that you've given up hope. Maybe it's somebody you think will never change. I can tell you as a testimony right here that yes, people can change. If God hasn't given up on them yet, please don't do that. My Uncle Bob, he lies on a slab in a morgue. He's finally home.
Lesson number three, Tanisha <clears throat> Hicks. Live, love, laugh, and listen. <clears throat> Live, love, laugh, and listen. Tanisha Hicks. Lung, liver, and colon cancer claim the lives of three very, very important men in my life. My maternal grandfather, my paternal grandfather, and my own father. But it was after the death of my father that I began to reestablish the principles in my life. It was after I suffered a long and distressed period of grief that I realized that I needed to rebound and began to embrace my life again. Fellow Toastmasters and guests, my life has shifted and I am now focused on living, loving, laughing, and listening more. Live, love, laugh, and listen are now the principles of my life. And I'll share with you why I chose these things as my life's mantra. Around three years ago, on a Father's Day morning, I woke up excited and on this all-natural high because this was the day that I would be graduating with my master's degree. So I got out of bed, went over to my closet to look for my favorite dress. And while I was at the closet, my telephone rang. So I looked and to my surprise, it was my father's number. Surely he was calling to let me know that he was on his way to Chicago from Michigan. He was gonna attend my graduation to witness me, his youngest daughter, achieve this great milestone. So I answered the phone and to my surprise, it wasn't my father, it was my grandmother. And she sounded really, really sad. And in her crackled voice, she told me that my father had been rushed to the hospital and that the doctor said that he was losing his battle with cancer and that they didn't expect for him to live for the day. Losing my father on Father's Day? Are you kidding me? This is the worst thing that could ever happen to me in my entire life. I thought it was a bad dream, but fellow Toastmasters, and yes, it wasn't. I was on the phone with my family for a while, and after several rounds of debate, they convinced me that I should go ahead and attend my graduation. My father would be pleased. So I did in his honor. But while I was at the graduation, it was the worst thing in the world to experience because everyone there was excited, of course, to be graduating this day. While I was there, holding back tears and wearing a fake smile. It was such a terrible experience. So the graduation ended, and I left there, went to the airport, got on an airplane, flew to Michigan, got to the hospital, grabbed my father's hand, I looked at him, and I said to him one last time, Pops, I will always, always love you. And no later than 15 minutes, I watched my father take his last breath. Fellow Toastmasters and guests, I've shared this story with you, not to get you to feel sorry for me, but to let you know that after my father passed on, I experienced a whirlwind of issues. I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep, I was on the verge of having a nervous breakdown. I was facing some major, major health risks until one day, I arose from my pool of tears and began reflecting on what you and I both already know, and that is that life is unpredictable, and our time can expire at any given moment, and there's absolutely nothing that we can do about it. And after reflecting on that for a while, I made the decision that from that moment forth, I would begin living each day as if it was my last day. So I shifted my thinking so that I could live, 
love, laugh, and listen more. Live, love, laugh, and listen. I chose to live more by living in the moment. Carpe diem. Why? Because there's no other time that's real. Worrying about the future or the past only obscures the beauty of what is happening now. I chose to love more because love is forgiving and giving, selflessness and happiness, and selfishly, I wanted my father to continue on in this life. But I accepted the fact that he had to be set free, and setting him free is loving more, laugh more, because laughter is a stress-free zone. We should fill our days with lots and lots of laughter. And finally, listen more. Because listening is one way that you can express your concern or discernment, passion or compassion and love for someone else without saying a thing. Winston Churchill once said that courage is what it takes to stand up and speak. But courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen. I choose to listen more. If you haven't already, there will be a time that you'll lose something or someone that is extremely important to you. And it'll be the worst thing that you ever face in your entire life. But if you find yourself in that situation, do not dwell in your sorrows. Embrace life and shift your thinking so that you can Live, love, laugh, and listen more. Thank you. Contestant number four, Yvonne Bailey, People Need Hope. Two years ago. He's doing better today. 
<coughs> well, my brother needs hope. I have a niece who's trying to open a boutique, and she's been trying for two years in this economy. My niece needs hope. I have a 13-year-old son who tells me he can't tie his shoes. He's autistic. I tell him, yes, you can. My son needs hope. I have a loving mother who has lost the joy in life. My mom needs hope. Hope, according to dictionary.com, is to believe or trust for something. Hope, according to Kuzni and Posner, co-authors of the Leadership Challenge, state, hope is essential to achieving the highest level of performance. They say hope enables a person to transcend the difficulties of today and envision the potentialities of tomorrow. They say hope enables a person to bounce back after being stretched, stressed, and depressed. They say hope enables a person to find the way and the will to unleash greatness. Let us entertain the idea that hope leads to greatness. The question is, what leads to hope? Hope can only be received or maintained through encouragement. Encouragement inspires hope, courage, and confidence. And when it is fulfilled, it springs forth as greatness. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to stay encouraged. And where can we find encouragement? Everywhere there is life, whether that's in nature or in others, or in you. I understand now why athletes huddle together before a game. They are encouraging one another to hope. And I know many of you have heard the song, sometimes you need to encourage yourself because there will be times in your life when you will need to remember that you are wonderful and fearfully made and worthy to be a part of this thing that is called life, and it is worth living. I see hope in my own child's eyes because he hasn't been crushed by the disappointments in life. And as he gets older, he's going to find he'll have to keep hope alive on the inside to survive. You see, it's much easier to encourage a child to believe for almost anything in the world, more so than an adult who has been crushed by the disappointments in life. I know this to be true. My loving mother, now that she's older, she has gone through some bouts of depression. And this last season, very difficult. We did not think she was going to make it. She stopped eating, she stopped sleeping, she lost a lot of weight. We took her to the doctor. The doctor said there was nothing physically wrong with her. Her mom weighed less than 100 pounds. We rallied around mom. We took her out to eat. We took food in. We bought her candy. We bought her cards. We bought her everything we could think of. We sat with mom. We listened to her. We watched television. That's what loving family members do. After about two months of this, I decided it was time to let go of worrying about mom. I prayed for mom, and I wrote her a poem, How Can I Convey? How can I convey to you that your life is worth living? How can I help you gain a new perspective of the gift God has given you with each day you awaken? When you opened your eyes today, there was a world of opportunities surrounding you just waiting for you to do you. No one else can do you. Because God created you and there is a plan for you to take your rightful place in this land and at this time. You have not completed your assignment because you are still here. You have breath in your lungs, eyes to see, ears to hear, and strength in your body, so therefore you live. If you are not pleased with your life, you possess the power to change it. Do not be afraid as God promised to never leave you nor to forsake you. I know sometimes things are difficult and I know sometimes things are downright hard. But this is not the time to give up. This is the time to start. Start believing in a power greater than yourself. Start standing on the promises of God and nothing else. This is the time for you to realize you are greater than your eyes can see. This is the time for you to exercise your faith and to believe that your life is worth living. So come on. Start with today. Choose life. It's up to you. I share this story because you may be the person who has to <coughs> give someone a monetary gift or give someone a hug, or give someone a card, or buy them a meal. Because we are the hope people need. 
Perhaps yesterday you failed to do your best. Yeah. But today you are blessed to be able to take another test of your faith, to get up, get out, and get on with getting something done. Whatever you need is a possibility, but you have to ask for it, seek for it, knock for it. And sometimes you have to try again to succeed at it. And lastly, stay encouraged. Keep hope alive. Allow your hope to spring forth its greatness so the world around you will see you at your best. And then they will be encouraged to hope.
So my parents rented a hospital bed and a nightstand and a commode and moved them into our living room. My grandmother's condition caused her to make frequent trips to the bathroom. And someone had to be with her all the time, especially during the night when that need arose. My parents told me that from then on I'd be sleeping on the love seat across the room so I could be there to assist my grandmother. And for the next two years I did sleep on that tiny couch, often being woken up two or three times a night to the cry of, Matt, Matt, honey. Now this time of confinement could have caused my grandmother to become sullen or withdrawn, but she didn't take that path. If anything, she became more involved in our lives. I, on the other hand, was a teenager. I took the entire situation as a personal affront. I felt disbelief that I had to sleep on this tiny couch all six feet of me. I felt discomfort at the personal nature of my grandmother's needs. And truth be told, I felt despair. Because I knew she wasn't ever going to get any better. Yet all those conflicting negative emotions evaporated in an instant one day when, when I came home to find my mother waiting for me at our back door. She told me that while I was at school, my grandmother had suffered a massive stroke had fallen into a deep coma and had been taken to a nursing home. That previous evening was the last one I would ever spend on that tiny, tiny couch. And the last one I would ever spend with my grandmother, who died a short time later. You know, looking back all these years later, I think I finally understand what my grandmother meant all those years ago about the oyster. You see, in those two years, I was able, one night at a time, to apply my own remedy to that pain I felt. To smooth out those rough edges of watching my grandmother slip deeper and deeper into her illness. And in doing so, I was able to transform that terrible time into something beautiful a chance to get closer to my grandmother, and a chance to give back some small measure of the love that she had always shown me. You know, our friend the oyster doesn't decide how it will handle that piece of sand. It reacts instinctively. But you and I, we have a choice, don't we? We can determine for ourselves how we'll handle those pains that come into our lives and that come into all of our lives. We can decide what we're going to do when that piece of sand gets under the shells that we build around ourselves. We can ignore them and live in pain. We can get angry like I did as a child and, and solve nothing. Or, through positive actions, we can find a way to transform that irritant into something iridescent. Transform that pain into a pearl. Turns out my grandmother was right. You can learn a lot from an oyster. Madam Postman.
number six, Greg Thompson, that thing, that thing, Greg Thompson. Successful people are people of action. They know how to get things done, and they do it. Dreams and goals have to be put into action before they can ever be realized. Will Rogers once said, even if you're on the right track, you're still going to get run over if you just sit there. <laughs> Madam Contest Chair, fellow Toastmasters, and honored guests, in order to embrace and enjoy the success for which you were born, it is critically important that you, as well as I, learn to become self-starters. That means we must decide and determine to be people of action. Success in life is achieved by doing. Tragically, there are very few people who have mastered the internal motivation to be self-starters. I read one time a statement that said, if more husbands were self-starters, fewer wives would be cranks. <laughs> The rest of you will get that on the way home. <laughs> Here's the truth. If we are not diligent, we all tend to settle into a rut. It's easy to settle into a rut. Let me ask you a question. Are you in a rut? Some ruts are so powerful that we can be in them and not realize it. We cannot take ruts lightly because if we stay in one long enough, it can turn into a grave. The only difference between a rut and a grave is how deep it is and how long you're in it. <laughs> I want to give you the first rule of ruts. Stop digging. Let me give you some examples of how to tell if you may be in a rut. If you can't remember the last time you tried something for the first time, you might be in a rut. If you compare yourself to others rather than comparing yourself to the best possible version of yourself, you might be in a rut. If you are comfortable living a life filled with unrealized goals, if you spend more time varnishing the past than constructing the future, if average has become acceptable to you and you have settled for a good life because you have given up on ever having a great life, you're probably in a rut. Just about the time you were within striking distance of something really great, you let up and break your own momentum, that's a rut. <laughs> if no one is blocking your path, from greater things and a greater life, if no one is hating on your activity, if no one is jealous of you, if no one is lying on you, if no one is talking about you, <laughs> you are definitely in a rut. <laughs> is there anyone here today who knows of someone who is possibly in a rut? <laughs> Well, if you know of someone, or perhaps you are that someone who has settled unwittingly into a rut, I've got some great news for you. You can break out. <laughs> yes, you can. Today is a good day to break out and set new goals. Age doesn't matter, Donna. What does it matter to live a long time if you don't do anything with your life? <laughs> The only thing that matters is now. It's never too late. Hear me. No one can get you out of your rut if you are determined to stay in it. Conversely, Ethel, no one can keep you in a rut once you've made up your mind you are coming out. I want to give you a couple of more rules to help you break out your rut and get your life moving. Rule number two, you must accept responsibility for your own life. Don't blame anyone else. Because if you are unhappy, you 
are unhappy. <laughs> we love to project on others what's true of us. And finally, don't wait for ideal circumstances. So many of us believe if we cannot do something perfectly, we should not do it at all. I'll give you an example. Say it with me. Practice makes perfect. No, it doesn't. <laughs> Practice makes improvement. Poet and author Burton Braley once said, and I paraphrase, if you want something bad enough, you go out and fight for it. You work day and night for it. You give up your time, your peace, and your sleep for it. If all that you dream and scheme is about it, and life seems useless, worthless without it. If you gladly sweat for it, fret for it, and plan for it, lose all fear of the opposition for it. If you simply go after that thing that you want, with all your capacity, strength, and sagacity, faith, hope, confidence, and stern pertinacity, if neither cold, poverty, famine nor gout, sickness nor pain, a body and brain can keep you away from that thing that you want. If dog and grin, you beseech and beset it, with the help of God, I declare you shall get it. That thing I'm talking about, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> is your heart's desire. Successful people take action. So get out of your rut and get your lives moving. Madam Cox. Contestant number seven, Keith Fortman. Not the same. Not the same, Keith Fortman. Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and welcome guests. Not the same. Not the same. I would like for all of you to think of a time in your life when Something major happened that changed you forever. You probably weren't the same anymore. I believe that things happen in our lives for a reason. We can learn and grow from every experience. I would like to thank my dear mother for trying to win the Nobel Peace Prize and trying to teach me some of life's lessons. She had a very special formula. She called it a whipping. <laughs> the, art, the art of taking a belt and kicking some serious butt. And after each of our many sessions, mom would ask me the jackpot question. Do you know why you got the whipping? I said no. <laughs> she went on to give me the reason. I didn't appreciate it then but I certainly do now. All that she was trying to do was make me a better person out of love. As I grew older, I can remember the conversations that I used to have with myself. They went something like this. 
Why didn't I at least try? Why did I let that opportunity pass me by? Why didn't I do what I was supposed to do? My mother, she gave me such good advice. And as I listened to her, she, she said, you're going to be something great. And I went to the, the journey I took. As I listened to her words, see, she had those words telling me you can do and everything you want to do. And the words she gave me, I listened to my wife, and she relayed that same message to me. She said, you can do it. You can do it. So I, she dragged me to a Toastmasters meeting. And I really, really didn't want to go, but I did. Turns out it was one of the best things that ever happened to me in my life. You see, deep down inside, I had always wanted to overcome this dreaded fear of speaking in public. But that would take courage. My wife told me, you can do it. You can do it. And so I joined the club. Since then, I have learned so much. And one of the things that I have learned was that a lot of people believed in me longer than I believed in myself. I went from being a coward to someone who could stand before you today. And that, in my opinion, is a mighty long way. Things are not the same for me anymore. Oh no, they are better. Another advice lesson that I learned is that courage in one area of my life can be transferred to another. You see, fear is fear. And it really doesn't make any difference what that fear is. Let me give you an example. Several years ago, something major happened to me. I was diagnosed with cancer. Now I want you to imagine being there with me when I met that lead doctor for the very first time. Oh, I expected to hear some bad news, but what I didn't expect was the way that it was given. Without any bedside manners, he told me, we are going to cut you from ear to ear and you won't be able to swaddle for the rest of your life. Thank God that my wife, my sister, and my brother-in-law were there with me. But do you know what I remember? It was getting up from that chair, the screen to my mind going blank, and standing there, crying like a baby. From that moment, I knew that my life would never be the same. Sometimes, life takes sudden turns without using its turn signal. <laughs> but I had my faith in God. I had the support of my wife, my family, and I used my Toastmasters experience. They all helped me to get through a trying time in my life. They gave me all the courage that I would need to survive. And in the end, I was given a clean bill of health for which I am very grateful. My sole purpose today is to let you know that you too can do and overcome anything that you put your mind to do. If you are willing to do those things, then you too will not be the same. Madam Toastmaster.
division. We might be members of area 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, and 57. But the number I want you all to remember today is 212. And I'm about to tell you why. At 211 degrees, water is hot. And at 212 degrees, what happens to water? Water is boiled. And today, we got to see some speeches and hear some speakers that were hot. District 30 South Division has the hottest Toastmasters around. <laughs>
So I did. And they're doing the countdown and waiting for it to come above the tree line, and all of a sudden there was a poof. It wasn't normal, and I knew that right away. And about 10 to 15 seconds later, you heard the famous line that went something along the lines of, NASA, we have an anomaly. And that's when I knew I'd seen something that changed what we understood about the space program. And you have to understand that as a child, my dad actually worked on the space program. So it had a big effect on my life and seeing something like that was life changing. Definitely life changing. And you also mentioned that fatherhood was one of your most notable accomplishments. I'm assuming that's a life changing for you as well. Absolutely. Having a newborn at age 44, 45 was uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was my first one. The first diaper I changed with this. And uh, hopefully that week that'll change this week when we do toilet training. Uh, <laughs> you really have to be in a state of being when you're dealing with that stuff. <laughs> well, I wish you well with this one in Chinese. Thank you for that. <laughs> Elizabeth Stevenson. Now, you have been a Tulsa Master for six years. Six years. And how many clubs have you been? Back in the day, way 
<laughs> I was a cross country runner in high school, and I always had too much left at the end of the race. For whatever reason, I would get fatigued at the very beginning of the race. The winners would go on, and I'd bring up the rear, catching a few people at top speed. Well, I found out the marathon is my race. I had nothing left at the end. <laughs>
First of all, I'm actually a humble person, but this time I'm going to admit to you that I'm actually a superhero. <laughs> I'm using my powers for good. Phoenicia introduced me to a program called the Youth Leadership Program, which means that there's a couple of days each week that I spend with juniors in high school, juniors and seniors in high school, specifically King High School, and we go over public speaking and leadership skills. So I get a charge out of that because I really enjoy working with these young men and women. They are our future, so I'm going to do the best I can to at least help them go in the right direction. And they're very, they're much, you know what, we don't give them enough credit. So really, they support them and help them go in the right direction.
I rely on my uh, my club mates to answer that question for me. I, I like, do like to point out I was at the very first meeting of our club. I've been a member of it since. I'm very proud of that. I'll you know what it was. Long. I have been thinking about this, especially writing this speech in October, I became a grandfather. Hard to believe for a young guy like me, I understand it. <laughs> but I have been thinking about the things my grandmother used to do and, and how she used to uh, always be there for us and always like to play games that would teach us things. She taught us how to play rummy and gin and poker and uh, all kinds of card games. And she would tell us crazy stories when she was growing up. She actually would tell us we did something wrong playing poker. Don't ever do that. I know a place on Madison Street, they put a knife in your back if you did that. <laughs> I was like, like six years old. Really, Grandma? Yeah. I that. So I like to pass along my pleasant speaking with not as sharp an edge.
also during our club officers training, we still have the, the district incentive for for each club that had all seven officers trained, the Super 7 ribbon. Uh, can Maggie Long step forward, or do we have anyone here from Christ Universal Club Number 3?
The South yeah, division has yeah, excellent yeah, contestants. But in order for him to announce the results, we want to see what the South division can do in terms of applause, right? Free applause. <laughs> People in attendance today, Don. Nice. <clears throat> I might add, not only representing our division, Greg, at the contest, you win at the, the district level, you will also go on to represent our district at the International World Champion of Public Speaking in Orlando, Florida in August. So I hope everyone will come out and support both our winners at the district conference April 20th to the 21st. I also want to add that we want to keep in mind that it's also club renewal time. <laughs> <laughs> we as a district have not been successful the past three years finishing President Distinguished as a district and all that is because of each one of you. Each one of you doing your part Completing your goal is to be a better speaker, a better club, a better area, which means, and a better division, which means we are a better district. We've been president distinct. We've been, we've been a district distinguished district for three years, and we are very close to being distinguished a fourth year. President distinguished. President distinguished. <laughs> and a lot of that will depend on how well we finish these next three months. So it's very important that each of you, if you haven't already submitted your membership renewals, to try to get the <coughs> at least six members from each club by the end of this month. I want to thank you all for coming out. I appreciate our host, the Herbal Aces, for hosting this event this, this, this morning. I want to say thanks to all the functionaries from the south, the north, the northwest, central north, central south. Did I miss anyone? <laughs> <laughs> our contestants, as well as our audience. I also want to take this opportunity to wish everyone a fantastic Easter. We have Easter coming up. And we hope each of you and your families have a blessed and safe holiday. This contest is adjourned. Thank <laughs> you.